So uh, today we are uh, in, in week three of our series, Owning Your Theology, talking about how our thoughts about God and faith affect our lives and relationships. And today's topic is pretty simple in a word. Uh, it's sin. Uh, it's sin, or might even be sins, is an interesting question. Uh, we tend to think these are just a singular and plural, right? Uh, sins are, you know, the thing being kept on a ledger somewhere uh, that hopefully nobody ever shows to me. And sin is uh, what I did while driving here today, because um, uh, I was late. So, uh, you know, are we talking about individual discrete things we do wrong or that we fail to do, uh, and then multiply those are sins? Uh, not quite. I do think that when we talk about sin in the singular, it has a little bit more force, that we're not just simply talking about uh, breaking the law or disappointing somebody or doing what we should not do. We're also talking in some deeper way about brokenness. We're also talking in some deeper way about how our um, uh, how perhaps uh, justice is elusive uh, and that life isn't necessarily what it, it should be. We all kind of have a vision of how things could be better, uh, of how people could be better to us <laughs> and how we ourselves might be better. And so how do we talk about sin as some kind of a, a reality? The reason we're talking about sin is because, remember we had those questions, those, those catechetical questions, or I should say those confirmation questions that we're walking our way through. Margaret has a handout if you don't know what I'm talking about and you'd like to see these, these questions. Basically, as it's kind of a framework to thinking about theology, how we talk about God, how we talk about our own lives, we're following these questions as a way of ordering the topics uh, that we're going to uh, be talking about. And so we're starting with the first question, which reads, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, comma, that was Margaret last week, right? How do we know that God is gracious? What does it mean to speak about God as merciful? Uh, right? That's kind of the assumption that this whole sentence is built on. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? So today we're talking about sin. Next week we'll talk about evil. Uh, I'll be back to talk about evil next week. So I'll, uh, I'm going to do some research on that this week, get some practice in, and see how that goes. I've been working on sin a lot this week uh, as well. So uh, but what does that mean? Do you turn from the ways of sin? It doesn't say do you turn from all of your sins, but do you turn from the ways of sin? There's a What's going on there? Is this an allegiance change or something? Uh, so that's what we're going to dig into today, not to necessarily complicate all of this, but just to dig a little bit deeper and to show the ways in which we think about sin, the way we talk about sin, are going to have implications for how we understand who God is. Uh, we're going to have implications for how we understand our neighbor. Uh, it might show ways in which we're prone to dehumanize uh, other people, and maybe we don't do that uh, maybe we're not equal opportunity dehumanizers, right? Maybe there are ways of talking about sin that expose some of our own biases, our own attitudes. Uh, but why begin here, right? Why begin with this this question? What was going on with with um, with me and Margaret when we decided this would be a good pattern for us to follow? Uh, why not begin with things like creation or beauty or love? Why start with a God who's forgiving and the reality of sin and evil in the world? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, it might be because this is following the pattern that the Bible itself tells the, kind of the big overarching narrative of God, right? Genesis 1 and 2, creation story, a God who delights in creating, a God who wants to be in relationship with human beings. What happens in Genesis chapter 3? Bam, right? The so-called fall, right? Uh, with, the, with the serpent and the apple, you know that story. And then what happens after that is punishment, or at least banishment out of the garden. So this epic, mythic way of talking about what's wrong with humanity. And then you could say, well, the rest of the Bible kind of plays that out, kind of shows, you know, all of humanity's struggles to be either obedient or faithful or loving. Similarly, in the New Testament, how do the New Testament stories begin talking about Jesus in the Gospels? Uh, we have birth stories in two Gospels, but for the most part, John the Baptist is the key player at least in the beginnings of three of the Gospels. And what is John the Baptist's main message? Anybody remember? Repent. 
repent, right? Look out, a time of judgment is coming, God is about to break in, right? Time is short. So the New Testament as well decides to begin the stories of Jesus' life by talking about uh, brokenness, right? The fallibility of human beings, or maybe even the wickedness of, of humanity. So you might say, well, to start by talking about a merciful God and the problem of sin, the problem of evil, that's just following the biblical narrative. We might also say, well, this is just a key part of how you build an overall theological understanding, right? You need to begin with sin because how you think about sin is going to affect what you understand salvation to look like, and it's going to understand what you imagine God to be, right? Is God keeping track of all of our sins? Does God get angrier with us every day when those lists get longer? I mean, how do we understand God to be? Uh, is God a lawgiver? Is God an accountant? Uh, is God this cruel taskmaster who's always weighing things in scales and saying, ah, I'm sorry, you know, not quite. Uh, or do we understand God to be more loving, forgiving? How do we understand God responding to our sin? Is it with anger and wrath? Is it with heartbreak? Right? These things all matter. We also might be beginning with sin and evil because we could say, well, this is maybe the human condition. Right? Uh, a lot of us live with a deep awareness of our own shortcomings. Uh, for some of us, that can become crippling in a variety of ways, by ways in which we can't break out of certain patterns, uh, certain behaviors. Um, I'm not going to take a show of hands, but ask anybody in recovery uh, what that's like, what that feels like to feel kind of captive uh, to certain ways of thinking and being. Uh, as well, we might talk about the experience of being victimized by the sins of others. Right? What does that look like? How do we carry that in our own lives. In some ways, the human condition might say, please begin with talking about brokenness. Please begin by talking about sin. We might also blame some historical uh, figures uh, in, the, in the church. We might start with St. Augustine from the third century and the fourth century, who wrote a lot about sin and a lot about his own sinfulness and seemed to be tortured by this occasion where he and some of his friends, when they were children, snuck into somebody's orchard and destroyed a whole bunch of fruit, right? He writes about this as if he's the worst person who's ever lived. And I'm like, man, you were just a kid, you know? Uh, we might talk about Martin Luther, right? And how Luther uh, in, in his writings talks about how he was, maybe tortured is too strong of a word, but consumed by his own sinfulness and worried that a holy and loving God could never smile upon him. So a lot of Luther's big theological discoveries about a gracious God, about a God who freely forgives without us having to do anything, is in some ways autobiographical for Luther. In some ways, it's his own story of feeling like he was just a worm uh, who could never possibly uh, merit any kind of favor in the eyes of God to his own release and his own sense of freedom. That's a beautiful story, but we might say, well, doesn't that how does that get pushed on us? And, and, you know, Calvin's not in the clear here. Other theological thinkers aren't in the clear here either. But it just goes to show how sometimes a really influential theologian in history might still be influencing what we think is important or the key thing to begin with. So what I want to make sure is, is clear here at the outset is, first of all, we don't have to begin with sin and the things that alienate us from God. However, we've chosen to do that, and the reason I think that that's valuable is because, like I said earlier, that our understanding of sin, what is it, what counts as sin, what problem does sin create for us and our lives, how we talk about sin, the metaphors we use to talk about sin, all of these things have, an, have the capacity to influence how we understand the dignity of other people, right? what does it mean to talk about somebody as a sinner, uh, what does it mean if we're more likely to sin against some people than others? How does this matter for our own sense of, of the, the damage or the harm we carry of being sinned against? So the inherent dignity of other people. Uh, the second thing it influences is what's to be done about sin. In other words, what is salvation all about? I think it's three weeks from today. We'll talk about Jesus as Savior. Uh, Amy Marga from Luther Seminary has agreed to come and, and help us think about that, what does it mean to talk about Jesus as one who saves us from sin? Well, your understanding of what sin is is going to affect, right, what the solution is. Uh, it also uh, helps us understand a third point here is why is justice so elusive, right? Why is justice so elusive? Shouldn't we be getting better? <laughs> Shouldn't human society be improving uh, or not, right? It depends. What do you understand sin to be? 
if sin is just a lack of understanding or if it's just ignorance, shouldn't we be able to educate ourselves out of it by now? Shouldn't we be able to legislate ourselves out of it? Shouldn't the criminal justice system reduce sin in the world? Um, I'd rather live now than a thousand years ago, but I'm not sure the human race has shown that we are you know, on the way to fixing this problem by ourselves. So why is justice so elusive? And then finally, the fourth thing is I think how we think about sin is going to influence how we think about who God is, what God's character is like. Um, is God out there, remember the old Far Side cartoons with uh, his, uh, it's God is this old man, right? He's got a laptop in front of him. There's a, a button on his keyboard that says smite. And he's got, his, he's got his finger right just above the smite button, right? It's just, do we understand God as that? Like, oh, just wait till they mess up one more time. Uh, or do we understand God as brokenhearted? Do we understand God as also victimized in our sin? How do we understand God's response to human frailties and to human missteps? So that's why I think it's helpful to start. I'm going to take a page out of Margaret's teaching last week where she filled up the whiteboard uh, and asked for a volunteer uh, just to write down what are going to be one-word answers from people. And what I want us to brainstorm together, and I want you to do this in a way that's not going to trigger anybody or that's not going to be mean or you're not going to look at anybody else in the room in the eye when you say it. I just want to know what are some sins. <laughs> I want to start naming some sins. Again, don't do anything gross or weird or like it's going to like make somebody go home upset, um, right? All of us watch enough Hollywood films. We can think of a lot of sins that we really don't want to necessarily dig into today. But give me some prototypes, some basic examples. Would somebody want to be a scribe for us? All you have to do is write, get to write, yeah, dirty words on the, on the, uh, on the, on the board. Um, thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, and I think it'll be easiest out for the, the sake of the folks online. I'll just repeat what you say. So go ahead and I mean, give me some, give me, name a sin. Hubris. Good run. Pride. Envy. Sorry, we're going too fast. <laughs> I feel like I'm an auctioneer. Woo! Wrath. That's right. Well, there we go. Yeah, but there's a tradition in, in Roman Catholicism of seven deadly sins, seven sins that are worse than the other ones. Any others? Resentment. I heard greed. Cheating. Adultery. Denial of the spirit. Oh, that's interesting. Jesus talks about one really bad sin, right? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Denial. Lying, otherwise known as a bearing false witness in the, uh, in, the, in the Ten Commandments. Murder. Stealing. Prejudice. These don't have to be biblical sins. They don't have to be named in the Bible or not. They could be other things that you... Cowardice? Hmm. I heard meanness and lust. You're not, re not regretting your choice, Bill. <laughs> Slander. Jealousy. Gluttony. <laughs> One of my favorites. I said nothing that's accusing anybody else in the room. <laughs> Sloth is one of my favorites, of course, too. <laughs> Sloth, that's right. Maybe a couple more? Anybody? Yeah. Self-righteousness as a good coverall. Mm-hmm. I think we got, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> uh, now a task. I'm, I want to give each table a, a, a task here. Um, and it's going to be a different task for, for each table. So uh, how about in the back 
corner there. I want you to think about just as a table come up with by looking at these on the board, or maybe there's some on the board that you can think of that, that didn't get called out. Can you think of, uh, identify maybe three sins that you might call active and three sins you might call passive? That makes sense? All right. Uh, Ken and Mark, you're on your own here, the, the two of you. Uh, I want you to think of three sins that might or might not be on the board that are you might call an individual sin or sins that might be collective or systemic. That makes sense? Individual versus collective or systemic. Um, how about the table in the front here? Uh, think of three sins on here that you think are explicitly named in the Bible and maybe three that are not named in the Bible explicitly, but you would still consider to be a sin. That makes sense? Uh, how about here in the front, the four of you could talk about uh, three sins that you think are always wrong in any circumstances versus three where you would say, well, it depends. <laughs> depends on the circumstances. So hopefully one of you has like a law degree or something in law enforcement or something like that, and you can help parse those differences. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, okay, table here. I want you to think of three sins either on the list or not on the list that you think stereotypically have been assigned more to men or more to male gender characteristics and three sins that, again, stereotypically seem to get stuck on, on, on women or are considered more female in terms of, does that make sense in terms of what I'm looking for there? And then in the back corner, um, can you think of three sins that you would say, for the most part, everybody disapproves of and three sins that you think are kind of distinctively Christian? You know what I mean? Like Christian ways of talking about that. Does that make sense? Each table know your assignment. I'm going to give you about five minutes, and I'm just going to ask you to report. Uh, if you need me, if, I've, if my questions are, are confusing, just raise your hand. I'll come by. Okay? And folks online, feel free to think about how any of those kind of fit in your understanding. Aha. You've got two more minutes. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, Margaret's going to come around. If there could be a spokesperson for each table, that would be great. We'll go in the same order. So in the back there, it was, help us think about sins that you might consider active versus sins that are more passive. Or what some people talk about, sins of commission versus sins of omission, or there's various ways to divide that. We need to flip this. Yeah, flip it up. Um, I think we came up with, um, well, we didn't come to a great agreement about what was actually active or passive, but in the active category, murder and stealing came up really fast. Um, I think we ended up with lying as the third um, active sin, uh, followed quickly by gluttony, but I think we'll stick with <laughs> lying. <laughs> um, in the active, or in the passive, we had the self self-righteousness, Pride and jealousy. Excellent. Thank you. I should point out too, some people, uh, some ethicists talk about sins of, of accessory as well, we could have talked about. Like, what does it mean for somebody who commands somebody else to sin? Uh, what does it mean for somebody who covers up the sin of somebody else uh, or approves of it or you know, protects the person who sins? I mean, you can think about this in probably some concrete ways, right? Would we consider those sins as well, even though the person you might say is the accessory wasn't necessarily doing the harm or something like that? So, uh, the second table then was individual versus systemic or collective, right? Are the things that, responsibilities of each person, are there things that are more group type sins? Mark. Um, so Ken nominated me to be the spokesperson for our uh, two-person consensus. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, we may be an example of sin because we disobeyed the assignment, I'm afraid. And we quickly came to the notion that a better idea than sin starts with the same letters, S-I, sickness. That uh, we're both concerned with the way in which sin has been abused as an idea over mm -hmm. the centuries. And that when you look back at Jesus, he was more concerned with healing the sick than punishing sinners, mm -hmm. and that, you know, the remedy is healing rather than punishment. So I think that we also felt that uh, everything really is more or less a matter of both individual and communal choice. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't feel comfortable trying to distinguish between the two. So. All right. Uh, sorry to upset the apple cart there. Fair but enough. I'm, I'm, I got a new thing, disobedience, I think I can put on the board. But, but Matt, is disobedience always a sin or just sometimes? That's the thing, right? Yeah. What is that? <laughs> oh, it's Ken, Ken's fault. So there you go. We That's can another table. Write his name Another table is working on that. <laughs> this table was uh, sins explicitly named in the Bible versus sins that you would think aren't addressed in the Bible but still sound like sins to you. Well, for the sins that are explicitly named, we thought one, adultery, two, murder, and three, bear false witness. Mm -hmm. But then to say those that were explicitly unnamed, that brought in a whole different discussion. Mm -hmm. And Terry wants to talk about that. <laughs> so we just came up with two words that we didn't think were in the Bible, and that was prejudice and uh, cowardice, and maybe cheating we didn't find in the Bible. Sure. But anyhow, 
we think that what the teacher wants us to say <laughs> is that everything is in the Bible conceptually. That's what we think. Oh, the, you might say the that. Correct. Yeah. The answer is. I hadn't thought of that. I was thinking of things like, uh, like, can you sin against the environment or against the planet, right? Are there more th things that that a modern, that, that kind of have come into our mind more recently as, as part of it too? But you might also say, well, the Bible makes a strong case for caring about the creation as well, right? So, excellent. Good, good. Uh, this table is things that are always wrong in any circumstances versus, well, it kind of depends. The it depends we had an easier time with. Um, hmm. We did stealing. Wrath, uh, stealing, because maybe you're stealing uh, from food, yeah, whatever. Um, wrath, that's like anger, maybe that's just an emotion, and emotions aren't wrong. Sure. Um, and lying, um, mm -hmm. you, if during World War II, you know, you didn't tell somebody you were hiding somebody in the closet. Right. But then on the other hand, the always wrong, we actually had more trouble with that. And... Um, one of the things was uh, false witness, which can be the same as lying, but false witness in court. So you, it's always wrong mm -hmm. to, if you're in a court of law, to yeah. to uh, bring false witness, um, slander, and hubris. Mm, great. One of my favorite passages in, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, it says, what do you do if you're out in the woods uh, with your buddy uh, chopping wood and the ax head flies off the ax handle and hits your buddy in the head and kills him. There's literally a law about this in the Old Testament, which uh, I think, I'm not a lawyer, I think we'd call that case law. Is that fair enough? Yeah, like this, <laughs> this probably really happened, right? And somebody likes, <laughs> like I know the Ten Commandments says do no murder, but I swear I just, <laughs> you know, and so the, yeah, the, um, the Bible often has this view of being really kind of black and white, strict yes or no, but there, there's plenty of places where it's it recognizes, well, what about if this happens? So, um, Okay, this table, this is an interesting assignment. Sins that are typically male versus sins typically female. I don't mean, I mean that in terms of how a society taught us to apply sins um, perhaps unevenly across genders. Well, we had a good discussion and it took us about 20 seconds to come up with sins that were uh, male related. <laughs> Which were, and uh, we came up with uh, greed, lust, and murder. Um, and uh, then after, uh, took a long time to come up with three that were female related, and uh, we came up with envy, jealousy, and uh, slander only because women are often called gossipy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, thank you for doing that. This is, a, you guys, had a, you, your table had a hard assignment. Uh, Throughout Christian history, throughout the tradition, you will see often sins of, of power or misuse of power considered more male, right? Asserting yourself, you got that with murder as well. And sins that are typically seen as more female are often around seduction um, and, and things like that. So in, in recent decades, uh, a lot of theologians writing kind of explicitly out of a feminist perspective have said, you know, we have to notice this, that our scriptures are, are full of this. You know, the, the temptress, right, is all over Proverbs, for example, right? These uh, both uh, wisdom and folly are portrayed as these two women who are kind of selling their wares on the street corner, right? And it's, you know, a, 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 a young man who wants to stay on the straight and narrow path will not listen to the woman of folly. And it's, it's, it's very sexualized the way it's, it's depicted, right? It's pulling off of all of these these motifs. We could go into talking about how the church has remembered Mary Magdalene, for example, and, and considered her to be a prostitute, um, because of course she had seven demons cast out of her. And if she had seven demons cast out of her, she must have been really wicked. Well, what's the most wicked thing a woman can do to allure a man? I to try to, you know, uh, so there's a lot of, of um, kind of sexist assumptions that I think in, for a lot of us are in the tapes that we might play when we think about, when we think about sin. Um, some of that too has to do with uh, even the Greek culture that was so significant for how the New Testament uh, was shaped, where for a lot of, of moralists um, in the, in the Greek-speaking world around the first century, uh, the idea of a, of a man who couldn't control his passions was one of the worst things, right? A man who couldn't control his own self, but a man who was also too aggressive and too domineering towards others or too self-promoting was also often looked but it's all about kind of advancement in society, right? Knowing your place in society. So just to think about that, the way that um, 
this this has been gendered. I'll say one more brief tangent too. Uh, that a lot of feminist theologians have said, why do we always talk about sins as the things that somebody commits um, to harm somebody else? There are also perhaps sins of not thinking enough of oneself, mm -hmm. right? What a, what happens if you live in a society that constantly tells you this is your place, right? you, your opinion doesn't matter? Is it quote unquote sinful or maybe a sickness, right, to, to be in a position where um, you've been told that you don't count, right? Is that a, a symptom at least of sin or not? So this is all kind of ways in which, again, society has, has perhaps malformed us. And in some ways, maybe the history of the church has some ways malformed us. Or as one of my teachers used to say, this is what happens when you let celibate men do theology for 2000 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's another class. All right, back corner. Um, <laughs> no, not even celibate men, just men. Um, Things that everybody mostly disapproves of versus kind of quote unquote distinctively Christian sins. We didn't have much trouble with the everybody. We picked murder, <laughs> greed, and stealing, but we had a really hard time of distinctively yeah. Christian. We thought we, we were just having a hard time distinguishing that. Maybe denial of the spirit and possibly mm -hmm. pride because a lot of people in society think that pride is a good thing, pride mm -hmm. in your accomplishments pride in your team, pride in, you know, your family. But beyond that, we were just stumped. Yeah. I think that's good. When you, when you read the Bible and the things that it disapproves of, you don't need to be especially theologically astute or anything to recognize. Most of these are bad things. Similarly, when they talk about the good, the things you're supposed to pursue, you don't necessarily need to be Christian to know that those are good things. In other words, the ethics of the Bible, for the most part, reflect ethics in the broader world, right? People who are thinking about right and wrong. So um, a lot of this isn't rocket science. The, the question is when it comes to thinking about sin, it has to do with well, what does this mean about what does it mean to be human? What does this mean about who we are in the eyes of God? We could do a lot more of this and talk about a, a variety of things in terms of how sin gets a lot fuzzier once we start to scratch beneath the surface. Um, some of this has to do with, do we think about sins as bad decisions that individuals make? Uh, or sin is sin also about systemic patterns, right? Things woven into society or woven into family systems uh, as well, right? And how does some sin become kind of ingrained or inscribed upon people, which is different from, right, should I do this or should I not, right? Should I make the right turn on red when the sign says not to uh, because I'm late for church and God will surely not worry about that and it's Sunday morning and there's no cops out on a Sunday morning. Anyway, too much biography. Um, uh, what about generational sins or inherited sins, right? Is that, does that happen? Um, again, we could talk about things like, um, uh, like addiction and, and recovery, uh, we could talk about uh, we could talk about abusive behaviors and how abusers are more likely to have been abused themselves, right? How does that matter for how we think about sin? Is it more than just the bad choices of an individual who's not morally mature enough to choose the right thing, right? Some people have a real difficult time choosing the right because of how they've been sinned against. So how do we think about that in family systems? How do we think about that in church communities? How do we think about that in terms of nations, in terms of economies, in terms of societies, and how we um, build a world that we pass along then to, um, to new, uh, new generations? Uh, who suffers the effects of sin and how, right? Who suffers? Some sins have obvious victims. You know, it's one person doing something to somebody else or taking advantage of somebody else. Do we talk about the ways in which sin degrades one's own self? Uh, what does this mean when we confess our sins together in church? Um, and are we supposed to just think of the sins that we have done wrong? Uh, or is it also healing there to think about uh, God restoring the damage done to somebody who's been victimized by the sin of another, right? Is there a place for that in how we think about what does it mean to experience healing? <clears throat> the question of who is sinned against uh, is interesting. If we had more time, we'd look at some biblical passages that talk about that, that show confession when people talk about their sin. The most famous one of these is in Psalm 51, which is a psalm that's introduced as David's prayer to God after his um, sin with Bathsheba is, is um, it comes to light. 
Uh, there's different ways to interpret that story. If you don't know it, sorry, but I'm just gonna kind of assume people know it. Uh, I, I think that I think that that's a, a case of of a king raping one of his um, um, subjects as opposed to a love story. That's we can fight about that some other time. If that's the case, though, when David says to God, "Against you only I have sinned," right? a lot of interpreters say, well, "What about Bathsheba? What about Uriah, who's dead on the battlefield now as a result of this? What about families? What about you know the, the nation?" Right. So, how do we talk about who do we sin against? Are these just offenses against God, or do we also have to talk about the sins of others? A lot of theologians writing from minoritized positions or from the developing world have been pushing this really recently as well and saying, if you just think about sins that you do wrong and you turn to God and ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness and go on with your life, what does that mean to communities that have been historically damaged by the sins of the privileged, right? So we need to think about more than just asking God for forgiveness. And some of that bleeds into language about reparations. Some of that bleeds into language about um, fixing one's own behavior, right? How much of sin is uh, obligates us to think about who has been sinned against. Uh, and then connections to gender norms, connections to other kinds of stereotypes, right? Who's more likely to commit certain sins? Uh, chances are we've got some of those tapes playing in our head from how we were raised. And so just to be aware of that, as well as that come uh, things like economic norms and economic stereotypes uh, as well, right? Laziness, poverty, right? are those connected? Is that sinful? I mean, you can, you, you, if you don't hear this in your own mind, watch a little TV um, and it will, it will, you'll see it uh, emerge there. I want to talk briefly about how the Bible talks about sin. Um, and the, 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 the takeaway here is there's a lot of different ways in which the Bible talks about sin, a lot of different vocabulary that the Bible uses to talk about sin. In the Older Testament, the most common term that gets used <clears throat> uh, is often translated as quote unquote sin in English, is usually talking about some kind of a failure with respect to God, some kind of a failure to honor God. And that word sin is often used to describe something missing its target. So for example, any archery buffs in the room, uh, if you're in archery and you're talking about it in Hebrew, sin is how far away you miss the target with your arrow, right? This idea of not living up to a standard, not hitting the mark, not hitting the goal. There are other terms in the Old Testament that aren't used as often. One is sometimes translated transgression. Uh, rebellion is a better, perhaps, way of understanding that. And it's typically characterized as a failure to show proper allegiance to God or to fail to adhere to a covenant, to an agreement. Slightly different, right? And there's, I mean, there's shades of what's, of, of the difference there. <clears throat> there's also a, a word translated iniquity, which is kind of a basic moral failure, right? Just rottenness. You know, if you don't understand why, you probably have, don't have a conscience anymore. You know, this kinds of, you know, bad sins, things like wickedness and evil and treachery. There's a Right, all the good words in a language tend to have lots of synonyms, right? There's tons of great synonyms for evil and for sin. When you get into the New Testament, there's one term that shows up the most frequently, and it also means a kind of failure or a fault, similar to that notion of missing a target. It shows up not just in the Bible, of course, it shows up in all sorts of Greek literature, and it has a really, really wide range in terms of its semantics, in terms of how it gets used in a variety of places and its applications. But it usually just means some kind of a fault. Anybody who plays tennis, you know, you step across the line when you're serving, it's a sin. You know, you didn't follow the rules. Uh, you've done something to hurt somebody else, right? That's a fault. You've done something that disappoints God or that goes against God's law. It's that kind of a fault. Very, very rarely used, but in some places, and perhaps the most obvious, is the language of debt. And you know where we recite that the most frequently? Sunday morning in the Lord's Prayer, right? Some of you uh, come from Lutheran churches, and you're like, why do you say debts instead of trespasses, right? Uh, that's a long translation issue, long story. The, the actual term there in both Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer and in Luke's is, is debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Luke, it's forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted to us, which is interesting. I bring that up because in a lot of places in the New Testament, whether it's using that language of debt or using the language of sin, there's always a bit of an economic hue or a coloring to it. Um, 
we see that in some key parables about forgiveness. Maybe you know the one about the uh, the enslaved man who's forgiven a tremendous amount of money by the man who owns him, and he goes and finds another enslaved man who owes him less, and he beats him and throws him in prison. Um, there are various places where forgiveness is is depicted as the settling or the forgiving of a debt. Why is this important? Because, well, time, between the Testaments, a lot of what starts flowing in, or some of what flows into uh, Hebrew language and Hebrew culture, Israelite culture, some of this comes from Persia, which is a lot uh, a very literate uh, society that we have a ton of records of like debt keeping, a tons of like manifest lists and things like that. And into the Greek speaking world and into first century Judaism, we get a lot of understanding of sin as being indebtedness to God. Um, and so then forgiveness is typically seen as what? A kind of zeroing of the accounts, right? Or balancing of the scales. That matters. I think that affects the way we think because then of course, some sins just require what? More repayment. Uh, or we might think that that's all it's about is just settling the score when we all know that some sins never go away. Some damage from sins never go away, no matter how sorry somebody is or how much reparation has been made, right? Sometimes the wounds just cut too deep. Not to say that forgiveness is impossible, but I'm just saying, right, simply repaying something, and you know this, if you've ever been sued or sued somebody, right, money doesn't cure all of the, um, the damage that could have been done. And there are other terms as well. Um, I want to uh, I'm gonna put this on the board. It might be the easiest. Now you see why I usually like to use slides because my handwriting's so bad. But um, all of these are metaphors we find in the Bible to talk about what sin's effects are. If it's a burden, what's the cure? Relief, right? What's the most famous way of talking about that? You might know there's a, a tradition of the scapegoat in the Old Testament. Once a year, two goats get presented to the priest. One of them is for the Lord becomes a sacrifice. The other one is for Azazel, which is the name of a, of a demon, kind of a, a synonym for, for Satan, uh, perhaps, or just evil. What happens to that goat? The sins of the nation are confessed by the priest over the head of the goat. And where does it go? It gets driven out into the wilderness because that's where it belongs, right? That's where the demons live out in the wild is the, is the understanding there. The sins of the nation have to be literally removed, have to be literally taken away they go back to the netherworld where they came from, right? So that's the image there. We have this burden, therefore we need relief. Another way of talking about that we see in the Older Testament is stain or pollution, which requires what? A cleansing, right? It requires a wash. So you know some of that language. Though your sins are scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. In Isaiah, there's a famous line. Uh, failing needs a remedy if there's something wrong, right? This maybe gets more to the healing question. This is about something needs to be fixed, right? There's something wrong with the nation. There's something wrong with an individual. When we get to the New Testament, we see more language around debt. And what's the cure for debt? Forgiveness, right? So it pervades so much Christian imagination whenever we talk about forgiveness. Not to say it's always about finances, but it does have this idea of an obligation that's now being zeroed out, right? Uh, enslavement, this is the Apostle Paul's contribution, right? Paul doesn't want to talk about sins in the singular. Paul loves talking about sin, I mean, in the plural. Paul talks about sin in the singular. Paul will say things like, um, well, let me just tell you. <laughs> Paul will say things like, uh, we know that our old self was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. In other words, for Paul, then, it's this idea, the, for Paul, the problem isn't 
I sin too much, I do wrong things, or I don't do the things I'm supposed to do. For Paul, the problem is I'm actually enslaved to this power that compels me to sin or leaves me in this world uh, where, where sin seems to reign. So what's the solution for that? It's not forgiveness or repayment, it's deliverance, right? Or redemption could be another word for that. Uh, alienation, this is, I think, primarily in the gospel according to John, where Jesus talks about sin not so much at, in that gospel as the bad things that somebody does, but talks about sin as this way of being unaware of the power of God in their midst through Christ. And so there it goes more, I think, from, uh, from an idea of, of um, excuse me, I'm trying to follow my slides here, of... Um, goodness, of alienation to intimacy, right? If the problem of sin is alienation, the cure, according to John, is intimacy. So you've got at least six different ways that the Bible talks about this. And I guess my question here is, what does that say about, what do each of those six say about God? You see what I mean? They're not all exactly the same. If the, if the problem of human brokenness, however you want to define that, if you want to use the biblical or the Christian, the theological term sin or not, if the problem is of this brokenness is a burden that we have, to, that's weighing us down that we have to get rid of, what is that? How do you imagine God then, right? The problem is an enslavement and God is a deliverer. What does that look like? If the problem is always debt or owing something, is, does God become an accountant? Right? In that regard, is God the one who's always keeping score right? and is always keeping track? Um, do you see different things then in those six different models in terms of what kind of God are we talking about or what is God preoccupied with in our own lives? Does the question make sense? How we view sin, how we view its effects, how we view what it does to human individuals and communities is going to have some influence in how we understand who God is. I think it's actually a plus that the Bible gives us multiple perspectives it's one way in which the Bible, I think, collectively bears witness to. This is a really complicated thing. We know sin's a big deal, I think all the biblical authors would say. Um, and we know God cares about it. We know it inhibits our well-being uh, with God, and God's committed to fixing it. But nobody can quite give a single definition to that fix. Um, yeah, Mar uh, Margaret's going to come around with the, with the mic. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is really helpful. And just to kind of go back to... Ken and I being provocative, I think this gets at the heart of what we were trying to, to get at, that the old-fashioned notion of sin usually quickly gets into you're going to get punished for it rather than I'm going to help you get turn your life around, yeah. either individually or as a community. That's what God is all about. And all six of those are examples of that. So thank you. Notice they're all over our, our worship language, too. You know, the spiritual glory, glory, hallelujah, till I lay my burdens down, right? There's the idea of burden and relief, uh, for an example. Uh, there's the one, um, what is it? I owed a debt I could not pay. Is that old folk song? And then, of course, for Paul, where it's enslavement to deliverance, there it's Bob Dylan. you got to serve somebody which I've never sung in worship before, but you know, um, right? It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Not one of Bob's best albums, I realize. Perhaps there's not many Dylan fans in the room. Anyway, other thoughts about what, what images of God come to the fore for you? Yeah, Margaret's gonna come by with us. So this isn't an answer to your question. I'm disobedient again. All right. Um, so what was, to your knowledge, was the very first understanding of who and what God is? <laughs> to my knowledge, what's the very first understanding of who and what God is? I mean, how did, how did the concept of there's a God in the world, uh, I, I realize yeah. the Garden of Eden story is <laughs> um, maybe your answer, but... Yeah. Um, my answer would probably be more to look at just human culture in general, that every culture has had some kind of a longing, some kind of a belief that there's more than what we just can touch and see, that, and, and that gets expressed in a variety of different ways. So I would probably, instead of going the biblical story route, I would probably go more of a sociological route. 
from the Bible's perspective, I think there are certain key events that that a that a group of people experienced that led them to start to characterize God. And I would start with perhaps the Exodus from Egypt that that a group of enslaved people somehow got their way out of Egypt <laughs> against one of the most powerful armies in the world at that time. And their response to this was God liberated us. And that became a kind of defining understanding of who God is for them. So that's a different, that's, you know what I mean? And I think that's, I, I, I um, because there's so much Exodus imagery throughout the Bible, that story gets retold by different authors in various places, which is to say it's stuck. It's stuck in a culture, right? What kind of God are we following? Is he the God like our neighbors? That, you know, that one nation over who sacrificed their children to this angry God. And they said, no, our God is the one who delivered us out of slavery because this God hates that. Um, do you know what I mean? That's how it starts to get then, I must not be alone in this universe, how it starts to get narrowed into something more specific. And then as a Christian, I would say in Jesus, we, 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 we glimpse something of the personality. Can I use that word? That characteristics of God through this human being who revealed who God was. That's my brief run through the last however many millennia of human history. <laughs> Did you have the, I don't know where the microphone ended up and Margaret has to go preach. Oh, blessings, thank you. And yet, yeah. Oh. I was struck by the fact that the uh, uh, it seems like alienation is a broader and more comprehensive categorization, and that uh, actually that some of the other categories could be kind of kind of subsumed under alienation as forms of it, uh, and would be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I. Um... In a lot of places of the Bible, they just choose kind of one of these categories and they stick with it. And you see it changing over time. Like I mentioned, some of that has to do with, with um, practices of debt slavery that became much more common in the Greek and the Roman period, where if, if I owe you money and I can't pay it, then I actually become enslaved to you for a given amount of time. And that starts to then affect the way people understand what do you do with the obligations that you owe to God. And so... So some of the, the variety here has to do with changing times and changing cultures. In that regard, I don't know enough about the history of Christianity in the last 2,000 years to speak too confidently about this, but I do think for a lot of Christian history, it's been this idea of debt forgiveness, right? You did things wrong. God's keeping a list. You're going to have to pay that debt back. You can do that through, well, for a time, it was by the good works that you commit that are going to outweigh the bad. Some of that had to do with things like indulgences, things that the reformers fought back against, and they said, no, 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 God pays that debt entirely. But you still have this idea of, I'm always operating out of a deficit. I think more recently, I think we've come to understand, and, and this, you hear this in the prayers of confession sometimes in the service, um, where it's more language of not just sin, but also brokenness, right? Which says, we're, if you want, you could sit down and write down all the sins you've committed in the last week. I often don't know what to do when it's silent during the prayer of confession, to be perfectly honest. Sometimes I just sit there and just sigh. You know what I mean? Sometimes I think about specific interactions I've had where I could have done better. Um, but I like, I think that's progress in a good way, I mean, in a way that we're thinking about sin as not just between me and God, but we're talk I'm talking about what does it mean to live as a broken person amongst broken people, and that should make me, well, I think for me, on my, uh, when, when I am more theologically aware, it makes me way more aware of my own complicity in the injustice in the world, you know, that stuff that happens half a planet away I'm like, well, I bear some responsibility, but it also makes me feel utterly helpless in the face of some of that injustice, right? But it also helps me realize that um, 
just to be maybe a little bit less pr proud um, in the midst of all of that and to recognize ways in which um, like my failings have a real long wake behind them, you know what I mean, in terms of damage. And then you think about how does that ever get repaired where you have to trust in a God who can do that? And that's kind of my own, that's more personal than I think by the book, but but I find that helpful. I'm I'm also, and, and some of these again are, um, like if you go type, where does it say alienation and intimacy in the Bible? You're not going to find those terms. Those are kind of my terms I used to try to describe what I think is going on in the Gospel of John. But it is this idea that that um, that sin is ultimately a kind of a kind of betrayal, not a betrayal of God, not in the sense of you know God demands perfect obedience and I can't do that but a betrayal of like love or a betrayal of the one who knows what's best for me. You see what I mean? I, I, I want to move away from the idea of a God who's this um, sitting behind a big desk with a bunch of legal books who's got, who can tell me exactly what, what thing I did wrong and when, but an idea of a God who said, I laid all this out for you. You know, I'm giving you all you can to succeed and you keep messing up, you know, and that's, but and a betrayal of just love is different, you know what I mean? And, and now I'm thinking about my own father. Um, <laughs> like, what does that look like? Like to have somebody who sets expectations for you and gives you all you can to succeed. I want to move away from God as judge and think more about a God as somebody who um, who makes a garden, you know, right, and gives a garden everything it needs. Um, I don't know. Is that helpful? I'm just talking, throwing ideas out here, but doing therapy by by uh, by teaching <laughs>